Hello and welcome to Remarkable Life with Brit Syndrome for 2020. My name is Tracy and my daughter Jovi is 11 and she has Brit Syndrome. Every year for Brit Syndrome Awareness Month in October, we share our stories. And this year, I am so proud to bring you the stories of some remarkable Brit Syndrome families. In this four part video series, our families will be sharing their experiences with things like diagnosis, therapies and equipment they've used, misconceptions about Rett Syndrome, the hardest parts about Brit Syndrome, how the pandemic has affected their daily lives, and a little bit about their children with Rett. Please note that Rett Syndrome is different for everyone. There is so much that we haven't covered in these videos because those were not our stories to tell. Reach out with your story. We'd love to hear from you. Remember to share this video, leave a comment below if you have any questions. But for now, let's meet our families. describe it to others um, as a neuromuscular disorder. I use the internet's um, description as having cerebral palsy and epilepsy and autism and Parkinson's all in one. I describe Rett syndrome as being a really cruel and relentless condition. And I say that because of the way that it affects every aspect of your life, that it just keeps on changing all of the time. Where, where you are in one year is not necessarily where you'll end up the next. So it, um, because it's a spectrum, a spectrum of symptoms associated with Rett syndrome, it can be really hard to describe it. Clinically, I would say that it's a neurodegenerative disease that affects a whole lot of parts of the body. It affects the ability to walk, talk, use your hands, so many things. But more importantly, I would say that Rett syndrome is something that's horrific and devastating for the person experiencing it and for the people around that person. What is it like with Rett syndrome for Tilly? Uh, kind of fun and kind of not fun. Yeah. yeah. What's, she can't really use her words. Yeah, she can't right. use her words. What's fun about it, though? Mm, that she's cute. She is really cute, yeah. And playful. And, and playful. playful, yeah. It can be kind of hard to explain um, unless you're reading by the books and doing scientific explanation. But I've learned that Rett syndrome is challenging yet rewarding. Um, challenges us all as a family and even Aaliyah herself to meet all new goals and even old goals that we may lose and regain um, and things we just never knew were possible. How would I describe Rett syndrome? The first word that pops into my head is terrifying. I would describe Rett syndrome as a neurological disorder that affects a child's ability to walk, talk, breathe easily, and can cause them to lose control of their hand function. That's usually my go-to answer and my short answer, um, but on a more personal level, I would also describe Rett syndrome as something that becomes a part of your family's identity. Um, it affects not only your household, but all those closest 
to you and your child, those who love you and your child. Um, it affects aunts and uncles and grandparents um, in their own way, but it does affect you know everyone in your circle. And I think that if you look for the bad, you'll find it. But I can confidently say that there is beauty to be found in the midst of a Rett syndrome diagnosis. Did you know about Rett syndrome before your diagnosis? I had literally heard the words Rett syndrome. I had no idea what it was, but I had heard the words. I don't think I count that as knowing what the what Rett syndrome is. I, I think that I had really no clue what it was and to the extent of how it affected the body and the mind until my daughter was diagnosed with it. I did know about Rett syndrome before our diagnosis only because I had used Google to search some of the symptoms or changes that I was seeing in my child. And I remember reading about Rett syndrome and watching my daughter and just having this moment of sheer panic and thinking, oh my God, she has Rett syndrome and just crying and thinking, please God, not that because my fear was her quality of life would be so poor. Absolutely not. I had never heard of it, didn't know it existed, knew nothing about it. So immediately began researching. Rhett. Rhett syndrome, I had never heard of it before diagnosis. Uh, when my daughter got diagnosed, the geneticist was like, so she definitely has um, this one condition um, called Rhett syndrome. And I got excited because I'm like, oh great, like we have an answer and it's just one thing. It's not a whole bunch of things. So I was pretty in that moment relieved because I had no idea what Rett syndrome is. I had no idea what Rett syndrome was whenever we were told that's what Parker had. Honestly, I went home and I Googled it. I knew very little about Rett syndrome. I knew that it was primarily in girl, or only in girls at that point is what I believed. Uh, and so after I had the blood test, I found that that was something a lot of people, even medical people, uh, medical practitioners believe. Did you know about Rett syndrome before your diagnosis? Absolutely not. When we were investigating, I researched the possibilities of what she could be experiencing and Rett syndrome did come across and I put it at the bottom of my list. I, I knew about Rett syndrome before just because I had spent a lot of time on Google and a lot of the symptoms that Tilly displayed uh, matched with Rett syndrome. I did know about Rett before our diagnosis. Um, a couple months actually before I had stumbled upon Natalie and Sophia, Sweet Sophia, Weavers, Instagram. Um, when I found their Instagram, Sophia was in the middle of hospice care. Um, she has since passed away. And so I became really invested in their life and their story. And um, I'd never heard of it. And so I remember like, you know, looking it up. And that's how I learned about Rhett. What were the first symptoms of Rhett that you, that you noticed? The first symptoms of Rhett that I noted, that I remember noticing was her regression in her speech abilities. Um, when I look back now, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but I remember just like seemingly overnight, she lost her ability to use the five words that she knew. My son uh, developed quite typically shortly before his second birthday. Um, he uh, was able to go up the stairs, he was able to or walk up the stairs, he was able to climb a ladder, he was able to open a box of Tic Tacs, he was able to roll a ball back and forth um, and play catch with his siblings and climb in and out of a toy car in the backyard. Over the course of a few weeks, he went through a radical regression around 19 months, 20 months, um, where he, you know, he was less related. He stopped walking upstairs. He seemed very fearful. He turned, he was uh, no longer able to turn the pages in a, in a book. That whole um, period of time, he um, 
really seem to pull away from us. So a lot of children who have RET, and they progress, and then all of a sudden they go on this rapid decline and lose a bunch. Savannah kind of stopped progressing. So for the first symptoms for her, I felt like she rolled on time and she sat on time. And she felt like she had some low muscle tone, hypotonia, um, but we didn't really know the cause and she was still progressing. And then all of a sudden after she sat on time, it just stopped. She didn't get into four point, she didn't crawl, she didn't pull the stand, she didn't walk, she didn't do any of those things that you really expect a kid to do. So her first symptoms of RET were actually a plateau where she just stopped developing. In Abigail, the first symptoms that I noticed were that um, around about 14, 15 months, she stopped babbling and she started to make less eye contact and she certainly wasn't showing any interest in speaking. And a few changes, subtle changes in her movement. She was walking, she's always been able to walk for which I'm grateful. Uh, she was a late walker, um, but she started to do repetitive movements more with her body so a lot of walking back and forth and looking at the same things over and over again and I suppose just in a sense shutting down um, in a subtle way um, enough to get me using Dr Google and doing um, things like autism online autism assessments and the like and seeking um, advice from medical professionals well, going back to when Aaliyah was an infant, three, four months old, you know, we would put her in the bouncy seats and jumpers and things, and she would never put weight through her feet. She's always had, um, I guess now looking back, they're probably red episodes, but she um, would tremble when she would wake up, you know, startled, and that was as far back as we can remember. At three months old, he had three grand mal seizures all in the same day. And I guess that would be the day everything started. We first noticed a symptom at 12 months. Yep. When she was falling behind. Yeah. And she had progressed very typically and then uh, stopped the same type of progression. So it wasn't a regression and it wasn't a plateau. It was just the level of progression wasn't as rapid. Developmental delays were the biggest sign. And after diagnosis, it was the loss of skills, mainly speech. I first um, started picking up that things might be a little different for her um, around when she was eight months old, her hand use. Uh, when she was on tummy time, she would kind of do a seal stretch, but she wouldn't support herself on her arms. She wasn't waving, she wasn't reaching up to be held, she wouldn't clap, she didn't use her hands a ton for playing and whatnot. Yeah, that's kind of how our journey got started was just she got, she was developmentally delayed. How did you feel once you were diagnosed? I felt a big sign of relief, but I also felt scared because you go to Google and Google's scary with a lot of things, but specifically RET. Um, it seems like people, a lot of people only post the bad and forget to remind you of all the good that comes along with it. I just remember looking it up online and Googling it and the limited information that was out there would say red syndrome males lethal. Really struck me over and over and uh, I can't say how much it meant to connect with other parents at that point of boys online because they're at that point we thought we were the only ones. Pretty terrifying place to be because there was no blueprint of what lies ahead or what could potentially lie ahead with a male. So uh, that was pretty intense experience. I, <laughs> not good, scared and dark. Hopeless, um, scared, 
withdrawn. The information online about boys with Rett syndrome is slim and grim. There's not very much information about boys with Rett syndrome and what you do find is very morbid. How did I feel once I got the diagnosis? I felt relieved that we had an answer, um, but I didn't know what Rett syndrome was right away. So once we got the diagnosis, I immediately start researching. Rett syndrome is so vast in its symptoms and its severities that researching on Google and it's just, it really can, it's always the worst case scenario. And so I quickly went into a downward spiral after about a week of just intensive research and reading things I had to stop because one night I just broke down. <laughs> I just totally, as ugly of a cry as humanly possible, I had it. I woke up the next morning and I prayed and from that point on I feel like God really gave me a sense of peace about it. I don't want to say that I'm cool with the fact that my daughter has Rett syndrome or that I'm okay with it. I am still very scared and nervous um, with what my daughter's future could consist of. I, I'm at peace with it and we only found out several months ago. So I'm still at the very, very early stages of this journey. <laughs> I was really torn when, I, when Savannah received her diagnosis. I think that somehow in some way, and like maybe it was shock or something, but I just kept clinging to the fact that Savannah did not have a terminal diagnosis. She's not going to die tomorrow. And so in that way, I tried to feel optimistic and positive, but I felt absolutely shattered in general. I was completely devastated, completely gutted. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really just felt like I lost my world. I'm going to be honest, I was devastated to get the diagnosis. I felt full of fear, I felt full of anger, and I felt full of grief. I. It was heartbreaking to look at this beautiful child and think, why has this happened? And the fear about what her life would become and how small her world would become. I remember exactly what I was wearing, what I was doing, um, where I was when I, you know, got that call. And I remember in that moment feeling terrified and hopeless and scared and heartbroken. Terrified for what was to come. Hopeless that this was the answer we had been searching for and it was Rhett. Scared to see what was going to happen to Ollie just from what I knew about Rhett. And um, yeah. I think our biggest feeling was relief because it was just so time consuming to try to get appointments with doctors. The other Thank Thank part was one of the doctors was telling us that she was just gonna grow out of it and be normal and we knew, um, we knew that she wasn't, we knew that something was different about her. It was nice to have the hope that it was gonna grow out of it, but we also thought that that was just not accurate yeah. uh, and then the diagnosis was just kind of like that um, I guess the relief there yeah and the relief that we could get services for our need then we had a, a name for what what we knew was an issue what advice would you give to a family with a new diagnosis allow yourself to grieve do not try to hold the world on your shoulders you can take a day a week a month to cry to let it out. Your life is changing. Your child's life is changing. What hope you have for your child is changing. We can still have great hope and hope for the best for the future for them. But in reality, we know certain things aren't gonna happen for them. And that's okay to grieve for your loss.
definitely ask for help from different rep families because the knowledge is just overwhelming in these Facebook groups and some of the veteran parents of children and adults with Rett syndrome, they really just have a wealth of knowledge to share. The first advice I would give to a family with a new diagnosis is please don't panic. At the moment it feels horrible, it feels overwhelming and devastating. Please don't assume that everything you read about Rett syndrome is going to apply to your child. It's not. Just know that you will find a strength that you didn't even know you had. Not to get so lost in the diagnosis that you forget to live in the current moments. I was very guilty of that. Um, spent many hours at night reading and reading and all of everything that is possible. Um, and I think it's because I was afraid due to the fact that there's so much unknown with it. You know, and every child varies. But my best advice I could give is live in the moment, enjoy that child for that moment, the good, the bad, the ugly, and just just love your child. What advice would you give to a family with a new diagnosis? The advice I would give to a family with a new diagnosis is to breathe and to know that everything that you're feeling is normal and okay. That um, it's okay to grieve and it's okay to grieve for, you know, months after a diagnosis. There's no timeline for grieving. And there are people in your circle maybe and your family who won't understand that. But don't rush the process. And in the midst of all of that, I would say to continue to reach out to your circle, be it family, be it church, be it, you know, whoever you consider your circle and let yourself be loved during this time. Reach out to other parents and that it's okay to be sad and to hurt and to cry and <sighs> that once you start to grieve appropriately, you will be able to move forward. And I think that if there's one critical piece of the whole Rett syndrome pie for anybody, uh, any parent of a child with Rett syndrome, it really is to remain hopeful. And hope is kind of that f fuel that you need to keep pushing through all these therapies and, uh, and all these appointments. And uh, I would say, where do you get that fuel? Um, I would say we get it from the moments when he's outside or listening to music or laughing or, you know, giggly or smiling with his brothers and sister. And that's really what keeps you going. And it's kind of like sunshine in your house. You know, you have these special moments with these kids. It's really hard to explain if you're not um, going through it and kind of peeps out from behind the clouds during a really rough uh, period. And it just gives you enough to get through the hard parts. Thank you so much for tuning into the first episode of Remarkable for 2020. Please check out the next episode where we talk about things like therapies, equipment, the pandemic, and misconceptions about Rett syndrome. If you are a new family or looking for some more information about Rett syndrome, I will leave some links below in the description. Feel free to leave your comments below, ask questions. We love to get the conversation around Rett syndrome going not only in October, but throughout the year. Don't forget to share this video. And the more people that see these videos and learn about Rett Syndrome, the better. I'll catch you in the next episode.